the actor starts walking and you want the camera to pan with him, you've got to make sure that both those cameras pan at exactly the same rate. Otherwise, the actor will appear to slide around on the background. In an attempt to overcome this lack of flexibility, a company called Evershed Power Optics developed a process known as SceneSync. The project was headed by Reg King, an experienced veteran of television technology. He had been part of the team who designed and built the original Mull Richardson crane, which allowed heavy cameras to swoop and glide across the studio. SceneSync even had a test session at BBC Television Centre. We were at the time when there was a, a great interest in uh, computer control cameras and the like after Star Wars. The company that made SceneSync put out an invitation to the visual effects department and those that were interested went along and I think there were three or four of us that went. And uh, it was quite impressive, I mean it actually did work. It was a means of tying two cameras together so that they would pan in unison. But the way it actually worked was that the primary camera, which is normally the camera looking at the artist, um, is normally mounted on a tripod pan and tilt head. But this had a transponder, which was a wedge that sort of went in between the two. It was sandwiched between the two. And on that transponder were levers and things that came off onto the solid head, which detected the movement in both the tilt and the pan directions. That was connected by a cable to another plate under the panning mechanism of another camera. The slave camera, which also had a device between the pan and tilt head, um, which was a, a powered pan and tilt. So the cameraman would pan camera A, and camera B would pan automatically in unison. The slave camera was usually a lightweight, an ekigami, because the device wasn't suitable to have a full-size uh, weight on it. The main problem with scene sync from our point of view, the camera end, was to get the two cameras to perform in unison. The two cameras didn't have to necessarily perform in the same scale of moves. If camera A is pointing at a full-sized actor and camera B is pointing at a scale model, say a tenth scale, then for every metre that camera A pans, you only want camera B to pan a tenth of a metre. So a big movement on one camera required a response of a smaller scale down movement of the other camera in all planes of pan and tilt. So the whole thing had to be set up and calibrated very carefully. And there wasn't a, a dial that said that you could switch to a tenth scale or something, you just had this variable pot. And so you'd ask your actor to stand still or you place an inanimate object in the set and then camera A would pan backwards and forwards. And at first the actor would seem to slide around on the background, but by varying the speed control you could minimise the slippage to the point where he seemed to stay where he was as it panned backwards and forwards. That was a small revolution, really, um, because up until then everything had been static and so you, that would only allow the camera to cut from one shot to the next. This gave the ability to be able to move the camera. 